Good evening. Welcome into the space here at Chapel here at Eden Theological Seminary. My name is Kendall Moore, and uh, I am one of the co-leaders of our organization, Common Ground. Uh, it's co-led by myself and Mr. Tim Powers Reed, who just had a really wonderful senior sermon on Monday. So uh, I hope you did not have a chance to miss that, and you can go check out that recording on the Eden uh, Facebook page. Um, the opening prelude music you just listened to was from a trans artist by the name of In Love with a Ghost, and that song is called Trans Rights. Uh, we are here at Common Ground, a LGBTQIA plus organization advocating for the rights of the divine community inside and outside the walls of Eden. And uh, we are coming together today to celebrate and to celebrate, but more to bring into community the visibility of the trans community. Uh, one important date of note that happens this week, March 31st, is Transgender Day of Visibility. Uh, and that's from the, you can find more information on the Human Rights Campaign and more information is available at the link I'm going to post in the chat right now at transvisibility.day if you'd like to find out more information how to support other organizations and uh, once again thank you for being here with us and uh, I'm going to transition over here to Tim who has a, an opening statement for us thank you transgender an adjective used most often as an umbrella term and frequently abbreviated to trans Identifying as transgender or trans means that one's internal knowledge of gender is different from the conventional or cultural expectations based on the sex that person was assigned at birth. While transgender may refer to a woman who was assigned male at birth or a man who was assigned female at birth, transgender is an umbrella term that can also describe someone who identifies as a gender other than woman or man, such as non-binary, gender queer gender fluid, no gender or multiple genders, or some other gender identity. Please join me in Day of Silence Prayer by Kitridge Cherry. 
Silence is memory, remembering those who died young, driven to suicide by bullying or killed because of who they loved, because of the way God created them, because they were called gay, lesbian, bi, trans, queer, sodomite. Remembering Tyler Clementi, Leela Elkhorn, Brandon Tina, Matthew Shepard, Gwen Arahu, Haley Fentress, Paige Moravets, and many, many more. Silence is action. Calling attention to how people are silenced. When bigotry is disguised as humor, when prejudice turns into threats, and even to violence. Silence is solidarity. Students, families, teachers, friends, who care enough to share the stigma, to stand with the queer and the questioning, stopping hate with compassion. Silence is pride, LGBTQ pride, not letting the bullies win, claiming our right to be with dignity, part of God's rainbow. Silence is prayer for Mary's child. Whenever any child is bullied, Christ is bullied. Whenever any child is called names, Christ is called names. Mary's child said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it to me with sighs too deep for words, listening in the silence for the still small voice of God. Amen. A reading from the devotional Queering Lent, excerpt number four. It is right there in the text you hold sacred, in this book you call good, the vision is a beautiful one, full of mystery and paradox and peace. The wolf and the lamb, the calf, the lion, the fatling, the cow and the bear, and all the children, playing, living, together, led by a child. How beautiful. You say and you paint paintings and sing songs and celebrate vision. And it is beautiful. It is also unnatural. These instinctive relationships, these clearly established hierarchies, these unshakable binaries, predator, prey, built into DNA, built into the natural order, set aside for a higher purpose, peace. And you call us unnatural. You spit that word at us as an insult, we who redefine relationships and challenge hierarchies and break binaries. And so you come to our holy places to hurt and destroy us because you cannot see your vision of peace is queer. Good evening. My name is Sabrina and my pronouns are they, them, and I didn't want to do this sermon tonight. Even though I felt called to do it, this is a topic so close to me, it is difficult for me to talk about, let alone write a whole sermon. It's uncomfortable, and I must confess, I've been scared all day because the world is still based on those unshakable binaries that uh, Tim beautifully read. Being emotionally vulnerable, coupled with the internalized cis sexism that keeps telling me there is a right and wrong way to be trans, that I must conform to some ideal of transness that someone else, probably cis, made up, is an uncomfortable feeling that runs deep. But I am here because there's something that is more frightening and dangerous. 
Not showing up would mean giving into the deadly gender narrative of the patriarchy, the cis sexism that sees the trans community not as it is, but as they decide they should be seen or, or not seen. As gender queer artist and activist Alok says, gender is not what people look like to other people, it is what we know ourselves to be. And just because we don't see someone, it doesn't mean they don't exist. As a minister in training, I am called to model life-affirming behavior. And as a non-binary person, this also means modeling possibilities for those who need to see them. I want to be visible to all those who question their gender and offer myself as comfort, hopefully, for those who suffer because of their gender. I'm here telling my story de despite all my fears because it was the trans stories that I heard that made me come into myself. We all need to hear stories to know we are valid and we can exist. We need stories to feel our connection to one another and telling our stories help, helps us construct our theologies. I've always known who I was. However, for the longest time, I didn't think I had the vocabulary to express it. In the movie The Matrix, which is an allegory of transness, there is one important line of dialogue between Morpheus and Neo, kind of at the beginning, that captures that state of mind that I was in. Morpheus says, what you know, quote, what you know you can't explain, but you feel, feel it, you felt it your entire life. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind. I accepted the splinter like it was normal. I thought it was part of life. I didn't fight it. I let the world tell me who I was, even though I knew I wasn't that. And things were OK, as long as I couldn't imagine other possibilities. Eight years ago or so, I had my first encounter with the possibility of something else. I met a genderqueer pastor. They opened my eyes to the possibility of defining who I was on my own terms. Except, I didn't quite realize it yet. I didn't yet understand all the signs and the signs from years prior as, as being signs of my possibility. But I felt that something had definitely changed. I started questioning I started being curious, and of course, I read books. It took continued introspection until I fully came into my truth. And then, I kept it largely to myself. So fast forward to my first year in seminary, which, as you all know, is designed to get our theologies deconstructed. <laughs> I felt this deconstruction personally and profoundly I found myself reflecting on how a religious professional must be true to themselves, and so I gave myself permission to be non-binary on the outside. So cautiously, I came out to people. And it's been a long process, especially because a lot of my coming out has been done through Zoom during pandemic. And it's still going on, sort of. Not at all like it, I had imagined. You know, like in the Matrix, like all you have to do is take the red pill. <laughs> you know, becoming visible for me has been difficult and slow, but it's not like I'm in any physical danger. I'm blessed to have a supportive family, friends, colleagues, and professors who are supportive. Even my denomination is supportive of trans clergy. In my day-to-day, -day, the worst that can happen to me is that, is that someone will get my pronouns wrong or somebody will make a petulant comment about using pronouns. Why do we need that? I know I have a lot of privilege. And hate is a progressive thing. 
For many trans people, there are intersecting oppressions that intensify the interior struggle of their gender identity, racism, ableism, poverty. Life is way more different for those who are targets of more oppression and hate. But hate starts with microaggressions and proceeds, if unchecked, up to the point that yields violence, murder, and even genocide, you know, the pyramid of hate. Hate happens, as you know, when a category of people stop being seen as human by the haters. That of transvisibility is an issue that pertains to our shared humanity. Hate denies our inherent worth and dignity. Hate disconnects us from each other and from ourselves. So in, in addition to being hated by others, we start viewing ourselves as worthy of hate or worse yet, we may not think our lives are worth living. Suicides in the trans community are much higher than average, especially for young people whose families don't support them. A little hate begets more hate and then more. I've seen the increase in violence towards trans people during the past decade. I think we all have. According to the Human Rights Campaign, 2021 was the most violent year to date for trans people, with the highest ever number of trans deaths here in America, 89% of which were trans women of color. This year, we've already lost several people, including this month, Elise Mallory in Evanston, Illinois. Elise Mallory was a black activist for trans health rights. She had a family and a lot of friends and supporters. Her loss is mourned by many. It is important to know that for all these victims, even for the nameless, um, there are people who mourn them. They had family, friends, and loved ones, and their lives touched someone else's. It is important to know that the numbers in a statistic are people because this grants them a form of resurrection. All right, this is a not end of time, not eschatological resurrection interpretation, and, but it, this is one that I, as a UU, can get behind. And I'm going to argue that it can also be found in scripture. My favorite gospel, the gospel of Mark, says that. In Mark 16, the person inside the open tomb is pointing to Galilee, where Peter and the disciples will see, see him just as he told you. In the entire Gospel of Mark, what Jesus says to the disciple over and over is to do like he does. And of course, the disciples don't hear it and they're afraid. Um, and to see him is to see his works. One could interpret the resurrection in the Gospel of Mark to represent the honoring of Jesus' life through retelling his story. This is a view also held by Kelly Brown Douglas, who said in the case of the death of Trayvon Martin and those who were lost, lost to police brutality, quote, these crucifying realities do not have the last word and thus cannot take away the value of one's life. She calls this resurrection too. Telling stories of trans bodies who have died through violence um, helps us remember the value of the, their lives and grants these bodies resurrection. But trans erasure doesn't simply mean not seeing trans people it is also seeing us as distorted in an untrue cartoonish stereotype of a frightening predatory other who doesn't deserve the same right it, rights granted to cis people. Bathroom panic, anti-trans legislation in sports, in schools, and now in families as it is developing in Texas. There are currently about 150 anti-trans bills of various forms in several state legislators um, affecting all parts of trans life, including the criminalization of gender-affirming surgeries. 
These legislative actions designed to erase and dehumanize are all deadly. Lacking the imagination to accept a different view of gender than the mainstream one creates a deadly world view of trans invisibility. A world view that we can't overcome if we continue to travel on the same unimaginative path. How can we get away from this world view? I think we need to adopt a theology of trans visibility. This is essentially a theology that speaks to our human interconnectedness and our connection to God. All of us are human, connected to each other through being the image of God. This theological stance allows a change in both the individual and collective moral imagination. Here's how it works. When trans people see ourselves as children of God, not as a mistake or a broken human, we can reduce or even eliminate the sense of internalized oppression. And when cis people start seeing trans people as people, because they see a child of God and not an abomination, it helps to stop and eventually end the dehumanization and the hate. When we really believe we all reflect the image of the divine with no exceptions, then it is impossible to hate. In closing, I have an appeal for the cis people in this room and online. To overcome trans invisibility, self-hate and erasure, we need allies. Allies and friends who, yes, can see trans people in scripture and in popular culture, trans narratives in art and technology, who support us on pulpits and so on, but more important, we need people who believe us and see us when we tell them who we are because we are your siblings in God. And for those of you either here or listening online, if you resonate with the sermon and are wrestling outside of the mainstream narrative of gender identity, if you are questioning or curious or feel a splinter in your mind, I want you to know that you are loved and you're valid. Amen. Amen. So next, we have a ritual. Here's how it's going to work. Kendall is going to read a prayer uh, while we will light some more of the candles on the table. We will only light some, not all, to symbolize that the struggle for trans visibility is not yet over. On a personal note, the prayer that we'll read is by Reverend Sunshine Wolf, the minister who first showed me a different way to be in the world that I had not yet been able to imagine. I am grateful for their example, and I feel so blessed to have the opportunity to hear these words being spoken in the chapel. Let's go, Tim. <laughs> O oh, infinite love, help me face this day. My heart weeps with the fear of violence, of invisibility, of hatred. Open me to beauty and wholeness, to love and laughter. I am enough. We are enough. I live in the sacred in-between. I embody the connectivity and allness of the infinite. May I remember that I am inherently sacred by my existence. The earth is filled with magnificent diversity of which I am a small piece. May I remember that I am part of the spectacular beauty of a diverse world dependent on that diversity 
my existence for its survival. When I feel lost, may I hold to the earth and to community. When I feel invisible, may I have the strength to shout joyous gratitude from the rooftops for all who have seen me. When violence is before me, I ask for grace through the next moment. When I feel connected, may I share the, my love with those around me. When I feel seen, may I see others in need. When I am secure, may I rise up for the security of others. O oh, infinite love, I sit within you and shine you out to the world that we may know grace even when we do not live up to our most grounded values. We are life and we are lives worth living and my life is valuable as all lives are valuable. O oh, infinite love, thank you for the gift of the transcendent both all and infinite liminal glue connectivity. May I rest in that transcendent space today and for all the days to come. Aho, Amin, Ashe. For our next musical, uh, for our next musical piece, we'll be performing a piece called God Calls You Good. It was written by our friend Paul the Seal.
before our benediction, if you want to know more, we do have some resources that we are going to be providing. Zaria will be dropping a resource sheet in the chat for those on Zoom. And Christine will be handing out hard copies to those in chapel. And now our benediction. Friends, as you leave this place, remember that in a world that insists on its tired and narrow gender rules and regulations, God is in a state of constant transition. Though many try to subdue God, make God into the image of power and fit God into a singular gender, God rejects that notion and is the strength of change in a world that wants to dictate how others should be. God challenges our most basic assumptions about ourselves, the earth and each other. God is unwilling to stick to a single form for our own comfort and comprehension. We are given an invitation to live into the abundance of possibilities within and around us. Every trans child that is born to us is a blessing. Our trans siblings are precious glimpses into the image of God and they are gifts to this world. Our trans siblings now have the possibilities for living without losing a part of themselves, the desire to know and be known vulnerably, truthfully, and entirely thriving in all of us. Remember to always choose love. Go in peace. Amen.